All right, why don't we go ahead and get ready to start here. Now, why don't we start by coming to God in prayer? Almighty and merciful God, thank you. Thank you for a beautiful day here, and it looks like a pretty day throughout a lot of the other places where folks are. Thank you for bringing a lot of folks, here, the folks that are here uh, to us this day. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to, to get together, even if it is through a screen, but you know what? We're getting used to that. Um, we will never like it completely, but uh, you at least give us the opportunity. And we say thank you for that. As we come now into our time of spending some time with you, Lord, um, open our hearts, open our minds, keep us focused on you and help us to hear your message through music, through scripture, through the, the message that I bring, um, and just by being quiet in your presence, speak to us. All these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Light shines in the darkness. A star guides our way to the Christ child. Hope is born again. Light has broken in on the darkness of the world. Can you see it? Can you feel it? Open the eyes of your heart and light the light within. There is a star beckoning us to follow. Let's go and see where it leads us today in our worship. Let's see where it leads us tomorrow as we go about our day, our week, and the rest of our lives. We come to kneel at the cradle of the babe, the light incarnate. Come, let us worship the God of light and joy and peace. Amen. Amen. Uh, Please bring your attention to the announcements. We will have Bible study on Wednesday yes, we will. at 1030 via Zoom. Uh, John will email us the link, of course. Justine will be in the office on Monday, the 4th through Thursday, the 7th, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And Reverend Landis will be in the office Tuesday, the 5th, and Thursday, the 7th, from 10 to 3 on both days. Are there any other announcements? I don't think so, Kitty. Not that I know of. Right. I don't either. Then let us uh, move on. All right. Thank you. 
God of promise and light, open our eyes this morning that we may see your light in the darkness. Open our hearts that we may perceive your promises of justice and righteousness fulfilled in the babe of Bethlehem. May we, like the Magi, have a star to guide us on our journey quest to find the one who truly set us free. May this time of worship bring us closer to you, that the good news of the birth of light and love will transform our loves and our lives. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Time now to come to our time of confession. We don't want epiphanies unless they're a realization of how right or how good we are. I mean, we don't need epiphanies to show us where we're mistaken or falling short. We get enough of that from other people telling us where they think we need to get better. If that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do, then to tell us that our lives and how to live our lives and to point out all the ways we need to turn around and change then we're glad we have the option of not listening. No wonder we don't open our lives to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. If the breath of God is going to require us to look at ourselves honestly, the good things and the things that we need changing, then we can do without the epiphanies. We'd rather go through life not knowing than take a deep breath of what we need to change or how the world is different from how we see it. We'd rather stumble in the dark than have the light of God show us a path that requires us to change and be active disciples and participants in ministry. If the epiphany is going to require us to leave behind some of our old ways of doing things, ways that we're good at and have benefited <laughs> us even if they cause harm to others, then we just as soon not make the trip or follow the light. We complain that God doesn't speak to us, and we won't admit that it is us who are unwilling to listen. We refuse to confess that we don't listen or have the desire or courage to do what we hear. We separate ourselves from God so that we don't have to have epiphanies. Come, let us enter God's presence and ask forgiveness, insight, and strength to recognize the epiphanies. We're offered and to make those changes and make the changes that those moments bring. Let us confess our sins. Ever patient God, we are a people who live in thick darkness. We stumble around bombarded by news of war and poverty, famine and genocide, injustice and oppression, the maelstrom of things and issues and people of the dark can overwhelm and paralyze us. Help us to be people of the light, shining your light of righteousness, peace, and joy into all the dark places of our lives and world. Unlock the mystery and glory of the babe born in Bethlehem. Turn our aimless wanderings into a journey of purpose guided by your star. Let the light break into our lives and our world and transform us into people of the light. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. As certain as the dawn follows the night, so is the promise of God's forgiveness and love for us all. Arise, shine, follow the star, find the light of the world born in Bethlehem, and be transformed from darkness into light. Because of God's love, you are forgiven. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith as we recite together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us come to God in prayer. Almighty God, we're blocked away. We're not going outside. We're not talking to each other. And yet there's enough noise in the world that it gets through all of that and becomes confusing. It calls us to change our focus and our attention to things we, we probably shouldn't be focusing on when we should be focusing on you. Lord, help us now during this time that we've set apart, help us to, to focus on you and stay focused on you and what you're calling us to do. Lord, help us to look for the epiphanies and not to ignore them when they come, but instead understand that our lives are to change and that we are to look to you to find out how to change them. Help us to realize that if we're not changing, then we're already dead. Help us to understand that you call us to grow every day of our entire lives, our entire time we are here on earth. And so, Lord, open our hearts, open our eyes, open our minds, and help us to respond to the call that you have to us and for us. All these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This morning, a reading from the Old Testament, I think it's very fitting. I understand for those people that were up before dawn, they would have seen a meteor shower, which is really reflective of the glory of the Lord. This passage is from the second part of Isaiah's prophecy, and this is his prophecy of glory. Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations <laughs> to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense, proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 72. My Bible says a psalm of Solomon. This is actually a prayer for our king of the Davidic line and is asking that he be a just ruler and have a long and powerful reign. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. He will judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. The mountains will bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. He will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. He will be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers, watering the earth. In his days, the righteous will flourish. Prosperity will abound till the moon is no more. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. All kings will bow down to him and all nations will serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy 
and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Thus ends the readings. Amen. Our reading from the gospel this morning is coming from Matthew. This is actually the uh, year of Mark, but we don't have a, a birth story in the gospel of Mark. And so we go to Matthew and we find a, a, a story that is, um, we've come to know and love. Um, a story sometime we jam into the nativity scene and it really isn't. Um, it actually happens a little while later, but it's, um, it's a story of, of three or more, because we don't know the number. It never says three. Uh, there are three gifts, but we, there may be more of the Magi. Um, but it's a story that I think that helps us to understand that if we look for it, um, we will have these moments, these aha moments, uh, these epiphanies. Uh, and if we listen to them, we are then to change our lives because of them. But Matthew 2, 1 through 12, hear the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we've come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Well, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, hey, go and search diligently for the child. And when you find him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay homage. Well, when they had heard the king, they set out. And, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and they paid him homage. And then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. May God grant understanding to this reading of God's holy word, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us come to God in prayer. Almighty and merciful God, you break into our lives at times we don't expect, but we have to be open to the experience of you entering our lives, of you showing us a different way or showing us something that we need to see. And far too often we close ourselves off. Lord, help us to stay open to what you have called us to do and what you show us in terms of where we can go and what we should be doing. Lord, help us to stay open to all of that. Help us to listen to the Holy Spirit as we, and help us to understand that epiphanies come not just for the sake of the epiphany, but instead to alert us to the fact that we need to change our lives. You've asked me this morning, Lord, to, to come and, and bring a message, a message about epiphanies. And as I prepared for this, you know that I did have some epiphanies in this. And yet, Lord, I wonder, I wonder if I heard you correctly. I always do try. And so, Lord, my prayer this morning is that you will help me stay focused on you, that you will use me as a conduit for your message, not my message, your message, that you will clean up any misunderstandings I might have had in, in reading this story and trying to interpret it, and that you will give your message and, and bring home your points to your children. Use me as you will, but please, Lord, may it be what you have to say that comes to those who listen to this message. And so, Lord, now we come. Make me transparent to your cross. 
And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be holy and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As I looked at this, uh, this story, I, I, it's one that pops up every year. Um, Epiphany is a, an annual event, an annual time in the Christian calendar. And I look back over the, the sermons that I've preached over the years, and I, I've, I've talked about um, uh, how the wise men, um, who they were, and we'll review that a little bit before we go through too far here. Um, I, I talked about how the wise men um, actually caused a really tragic event by doing the right thing and uh, how we can't blame ourselves when we're following God's will to do these things. Uh, we can't blame ourselves for the, what happens sometimes uh, because of that. That's up to God. We are to do what God asks us to do um, in, to the best of our ability. Uh, and I had preached on that one a couple of years. Um, preached on, on the fact that, uh, that epiphanies really are something that we don't uh, we don't see uh, a lot of times because we don't want to see them or we we just close our eyes and and are oblivious to the world around us. But I don't think we can avoid. I certainly could not avoid this year to understand that that this year has been a season of epiphanies. The entire year 2020, and for all we've done to curse it and to complain about it and to be glad to see it gone, um, it brought us into focus uh, about some things. And I think God really was trying to say, look, if you're not going to listen to me any other way, I'm going to get your attention. And I think 2020 got our attention. And I would remind us that just because we change the final digit in the year, it doesn't change a whole lot of things. We need to look at what's happening in the world around us to really understand what is happening uh, and what God is trying to say. So let, let's talk for a minute about this. Um, it is This is the Sunday that we celebrate Epiphany, actually Epiphanies. Um, Epiphany is actually the, the official celebration is on Wednesday, January 6th this week. But we typically, the Sunday yeah. before, talk about the Epiphanies. Uh, of the Magi. And there are several um, epiphanies, not just for the Magi. Uh, we celebrate the coming of the Magi. Um, and, and we, I think I have to look at this and say, you know, it is the coming of the Magi in which God peels back that layer and says to the Jews, yeah, you're not alone. It isn't just yours to do. It is really um, up to, to, uh, all of God's creation, and the Gentiles are our, our children too, um, and the Gentiles will share in your, um, in your uh, gift, in the gift that God gives us. And so we celebrate the coming of the Magi, um, which acknowledges God as the, the or acknowledges the Gentiles also as the children of God. We also celebrate the defiance of a king um, as we, we do this. Um, we're going to see that the, the Gentiles, the, the Magi, look at the king, that the Gentiles look at, at what Herod has asked them to do and ask them, um, and, and they make a decision, and they defy the king. Um, and, and they leave him, uh, and they, they go around him, and they don't do what he's asked, because they recognize very clearly that what um, the Magi, or what Herod is asking him to do is wrong. And uh, Herod gets around them. Herod uh, does other things. But at the end of the day, um, the Magi try to do their best to avoid what what Herod wants them to do. And so they defy the king. And I, I think, you know, we've got to look at that. When we are being asked to do things that are not right, um, do we have the courage? What do we find from this? What do we learn uh, that um, we need to, to, to act on? And, and really, you know, I think we need to look at our hearts as the Magi did and say, you know, what is what we're doing right? 
or is what we're doing um, not right? And if not, even if it, it causes concern, um, do we defy what we've been asked to do? Um, some of the other epiphanies that, that happened here, and remember that epiphanies causes the changing of lives. Uh, the, the, the epiphanies that we celebrate today certainly changed the lives of the Magi. Um, they, we will find in a bit here that they probably left behind, uh, what they left behind was, was the tools of their trade. Um, they changed, they changed, it looks like they changed what they did for a living. And it looks like they may have changed uh, who they worshiped. Uh, these were, were uh, priests of Zoroaster and they acknowledged God as um, Jehovah as their gods. Um, and it changes their lives. It certainly changes the life of Herod. Um, if anything, it makes him worse. It makes him more uh, evil, I makes him more so. cruel than he had been before. But um, it, it, the epiphanies changed his life. He was not expecting a king to pop up. He was not expecting people from outside of Jerusalem or outside of the, the Jewish kingdom to come and tell him that the prophecies had been fulfilled. And he relied on his own advisors who either didn't or wouldn't tell him those things, but they didn't. So God said, look, I'm gonna send somebody else uh, to tell you that the prophecies are coming into being. And I think that happens for all of us and all our organizations. We, we don't wanna learn, we don't wanna hear, we turn off uh, the sounds uh, when it comes to somebody telling us what we don't want to hear. Um, and God says, ah, oh, you're not going to do that. This is too important. And God sends us an epiphany in our lives um, to, to, to get our attention, to, to change our lives. And he certainly changes the life of Mary and Joseph. These three uh, or more Magi come to Mary and Joseph and, and give them information and actually provide them with some resources that they're going to need before long here. But they, they come and, and because the Magi came, Mary now gets an inkling uh, through the Magi and also through uh, Simeon from last week. Um, he, she gets an, a vision of life is not always going to be good. The outcome, the end result will be great, but the some of the steps to get there is not going to be uh, as pleasant as one might hope uh, when one has a baby. And uh, she's uh, she gets this message uh, from the wise men or these these magi that, you know, what you've got here is, is a handful. Um, you've got what you you've got what you were pro prophesied to get. You've got the child of God, and they reinforce that for her. But they also, you know, kind of let her know that well, you know, that carries with it some consequences. And maybe that's a message for all of us that that when we get something, it carries with us with it some consequences. Maybe we should stop for a second and, and define what an epiphany is. Um, an epiphany is usually a sudden manifest or is defined as a usually a sudden manifestation or perception of the essential nature or meaning of sudden thing. In other words, all of a sudden we get it. The, the, all of a sudden there's a sudden something happens or something appears to us and gives us an idea of not just in general, but very specifically the essential nation, essential nature or the meaning uh, of, of what we are seeing. It's an intuitive grasp of reality uh, through something. So an event happens and we go, oh, or, or something happens um, and we get uh, uh, an insight into what's really going on that we really didn't have before, or we get a, uh, something happens and we, we understand we're supposed to be doing something different from what we're doing. Uh, but it's intuitive. It's not, um, we, something happens and we get, oh, oh, that's what that means. Or an illuminating discovery, realization, or disclosure. In other words, um, something happens that causes us to think differently or more ho hopefully act differently from where we were. In other words, an epiphany is something that causes us to get it. Um, 
and and I think as we look in our world today, uh, we're coming to an understanding. We're getting some things we didn't get before, um, and and there are just a ton of epiphanies that are out there for our avail and are available to us, but um, we we really <laughs> have to pay attention to it and respond to it. The good news is that epiphanies present an opportunity for change. Now, I guess that depends upon whether the good, whether it's good news or not, depends upon whether you see change as good or bad, but epiphanies always present the opportunity for change. They bring something into our view, our, it brings something into our consciousness that wasn't there or was lurking in the background. It brings it to clear view. And with that clear view, undoubtedly and, and almost inevitably, it brings that opportunity for change. Now, whether we take that opportunity or not is something entirely different, but we have an opportunity each time there's an epiphany, we have an opportunity for change. Problem with change is that any change requires courage. Um, and a lot of times we, we don't have the courage or we don't think we have the courage to, to make the changes that we need to make that an epiphany points us at. An epiphany doesn't make the change. An epiphany points us to a change. But in order to make any change, you, you got to have some guts. You got to be willing to, to take a risk and take a chance uh, for that change to, to occur and or to make any difference. Let me give you my definition of courage. Uh, my definition says courage is to choose to do something that involves risk and makes a positive difference. In other words, um, change is, if it's not going to have a positive difference or a positive outcome, um, it usually doesn't take any courage to make that. Because if we're making a, a decision, if we're taking action that has... Um, that makes a difference, but only a difference for us. Um, it doesn't take any courage. What takes courage is making a difference that involves a, a risk, but it makes a positive difference in the world around us or in the people around us. And an epiphany gives us that opportunity to display our courage and gives us an opportunity to make changes with, with some courage involved and are engaged. Let's stop for a minute and just talk about who the Magi were, because I think I ha we have to understand epiphany. I think we have to understand courage. I think we have to understand change. And we have to understand who these guys were, because, you know, we, we've gotten into the we three kings of Orient are um, mindset, and they weren't kings. <laughs> they were priests, and they were priests of Zoroaster. Uh, Zoroaster is uh, uh, actually a, a prophet uh, I forget the name. I can't pronounce the name of the god that they worship, but it's uh, Zoroastrianism was a prevalent religion at that time uh, from from Persia, um, and it competed for followers with Judaism and Christianity. Um, it was a large religion in the time of Christ's birth, uh, and it was as big as Judaism and and um, Christianity hadn't been born at that point, but it was it was a big religion and one of the primary religions in the Middle East, um, and it still does compete with uh, Judaism and Christianity, and and uh, particularly in the West. Uh, interesting that this Eastern religion has become uh, a primary competitor uh, for believers, uh, and and we recognize Zoroastrianism. Uh, not as Zoroastrianism, it, it's a lot of the New Age stuff, the interest in angels and uh, things. It's really rooted in Zoroastrianism. And by the way, if you spend some time and do a little research and look up Zoroastrianism, because we don't have time to cover it here, but it's not all that different in its core um, from, from Christianity or Judaism in terms of there's, there's good, there's evil, uh, there is uh, those who, there is a, a ruler of each. Um, angels are, are the God's messengers. Um, now, obviously we have Christ and we have the opportunity for salvation. Um, we have a, a 
advocate for us in the Holy Spirit. And so the Trinity is the major difference. But if you look at Zoroaster, you Zoroastrianism, you understand part of the popularity of, um, of the New Age movement, and it hasn't gone away. Um, and you also understand a little bit of how people can confuse Zoroastrianism uh, with Christianity and Judaism. These guys were priests of Zoroastrianism. There's five classes of priests in their case. There's the Hartumen, who basically were the interpreters of the sacred writings of Zoroastrianism. Um, and their job was basically to be preachers and, and to, to be prophets and to understand, and I'm sorry, not prophets, but preachers and teachers uh, who um, really did uh, <laughs> interpret the, the readings as they were. Um, they were also guards of the sacred fire, and fire was a, a sacred thing for Zoroastrianism, still is, um, and so they were keepers uh, of what we would call the eternal light. Uh, for the Jews, it's the eternal light, um, and so they were guards of the sacred fire. They were also responsible for the dead. So in other words, they were the ones who would prepare the bodies, whatever. They were the ones who would do funerals. They would make sure that the proper rites would be handled uh, so that the dead would have a chance to go into uh, and the presence of God. And, and for them and for many religions, how the, how the dead are, the bodies of the dead are treated uh, is a big deal in terms of getting them into the presence of God um, and uh, that was the, the job of the Hartumen uh, to take care of that. Also, they were responsible for the souls of the dead. The Asafim were conjurers. They were the magicians. They were, um, they were, they could conjure up uh, different things, visions and things like that. And so that was their job. And the Mecca Safim were exorcists, um, musicians, uh, magician, musicians rather, magicians rather, and soothsayers. They were the prophets. They were the exorcists. If there was an evil spirit somewhere, you called a Mecca Safim to uh, exorcise, uh, exorcise the evil spirit. And they were magicians. They were they could create illusions and things. Conjurers called up spirits. Okay, uh, the conjurers were to make the contact with the dead. Uh, they were the mediums, if you will, but the, the Mecca Safim were uh, exorcists. They were also soothsayers. They were the ones who foretold the future. Um, and you can see, by the way, if, uh, if somebody wants to twist something, uh, the soothsayers, the Mecca Safim could have done that pretty well. The Gozerim foretold the births of great people. In other words, they were the ones who would perceive that you know, in the year 2021, someone would be born who would be great in this area. They would be a king. They would be a leader. They would be something big. They would see the, the coming of the big people. And, and we would assume that at least one of, if not all three of, uh, the Magi who came to, to on the journey uh, to find Christ uh, was a Gozerim. Uh, they had seen the great the the birth of this great person this king of king of the jews and then the costume were the astrologers they were called dan typically um the astrologers then said okay this is what the stars in the heavens are telling us and the kasadim and the, the costume rather and the gozerim uh, would work together um to to find the 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 birth of the great people. That's that's who they were. And so we can see they weren't necessarily kings. They could be very wise, but they each had a, a purpose and um, they were looking for uh, the king of the Jews. And they believed that the stars would tell them that. There were genuine practitioners and, and there were charlatans uh, in the Magi, just like every place else. Um, and there were enough charlatans that, that Paul uh, prohibits uh, against the um, against the Kasdim, uh, mm -hmm. prohibits talking to them. Ast astrology was used to mislead people and lead them astray. And so um, Paul um, says, ah, stay away from them. 
Now they're going to take you down the wrong path. But the ones who arrive at, at the, uh, the, uh, at the stable apparently are sincere and honest men. Um, they, they're on a genuine quest and these guys are certainly courageous. Um, and if you ask me what, what they did that was so courageous, well, they defied the king. That's a pretty courageous thing to do. Now, again, they're foreigners traveling in a foreign land, but uh, they, they put their lives at risk by um, not doing what the king says um, and by going back to their country by a way, uh, a different way than they came. So they can't be tracked or followed and not going back to Herod and saying, oh yeah, here's where the child is. Here's where you find him. Here's how old he is. Here's, um, here's his family's name. They had a sense that something wasn't right. And so they said, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to do what's right. And, and the Magi actually changed their lives. And remember that epiphany is an event or realization that actually changes the course of a life. That's the purpose of an epiphany when they come. And it's, it's really possible that they gave up their professions. Um, gold was actually a magical metal. It wasn't intended. It, it's always been valuable as, as currency. But the gold that, that they left really was um, uh, intended to be and, and used for magic. Um, it was uh, to a, an essential part of many of the mag magical um, things that, that they did. Uh, they also, it's believed, left their golden idols. Um, I heard one comment commentator speaking or read one commentator speaking of they left their golden idols they left the idols to their uh to their gods uh behind that was the gold that they left or they and they also left gold that they would um use in these magical alchemists use gold that was the whole point of alchemy was um to change things into gold uh, and then to use that gold um, frankincense was used to conjure images. In other words, the incense would cause uh, people to see um, the, the spirits around them. Um, and so you got to wonder if it was frankincense or one of the other drugs. But at any rate, the frankincense was used to conjure images. Remember, that's one of the ways that the Magi made their living uh, was to, to conjure up images for people. And then myrrh, uh, and, and uh, when you go back to uh, the first of, of the Magi, they were responsible for the sacred fire and for the death. They would also be responsible for heal, healing. And uh, myrrh is used, and still to this day, is used as a healing ointment. And that's what they leave behind. And so they certainly give gifts that are important to them, but you have to wonder, do they leave their life behind? In other words, has this epiphany caused them to say, enough of what I was doing, it's time for me to do new and different things. And I really believe that that's, that's one of the key messages of this story, uh, why we're told what they leave behind, not just that they're generous, but what they leave behind is what they were. And that happens because of this epiphany. That's pretty gutsy, pretty courageous. In other words, if you're going to leave behind a primary way of making your living, that's pretty gutsy. And, and that could be very possibly what we see here. Let me ask you a question as you come into the new year. What do you need to leave behind in order to make meaningful changes in your life? What's God calling you to do? Um, what do you need, what do you need to, to leave behind? What, what has, may have served you well, but now you need to leave it behind and move on to something new. It's a hard question. And it's certainly one that I'm wrestling with and we all wrestle with, I think. But as we come through this new year, in light of the epiphany of 2020, what do we need to leave behind? I think part of what we find is what we thought was important isn't. And what wasn't important may, in fact, be very important. 
we're called, I think, to change our lives. And I think this story calls us to change our lives. And no life is changed without a risk. And it's a risk to both the one who calls for the change and the one who changes. In other words, when we change our lives, we take a risk. But, but God, although God knows everything, it's still God is, because we have the power of choice, God it doesn't necessarily know what the outcome is. It's pretty predictable. Um, but God, there, there's a risk that we might make the wrong sets of choices and we might change and it might not work the way that it was supposed to, that God laid it out, that God planned for. We may not arrive there because of things that we do as human beings. Um, we, we don't respond as God and God takes a risk, but we take a risk too. Anytime we leave what we know to take on something new and different and a different challenge, we take a risk. And, and if we're gonna change our life, that is a risk, we're taking a risk. And so now we have to have faith that, that God will not, doesn't call us to, to change our lives and then leave us there. It was interesting. I was watching uh, the Weather Channel yesterday, and and there were three guys out in the woods with a uh, an experienced woodsman who was teaching them how to do things. And um, it, it, they have a day after towards the end of the week where um, they're now we're going to be out on their own. And the the experienced woodsman, the, the teacher, says, uh, "But I'm not going to check on you. You're on your own." And um, the panic <laughs> that ensued for them was pretty strong. And yet they found mm -hmm. out they could do what they needed to do without the interference of, uh, of the, the expert. And I think sometimes God puts us out there and, and asks us to do different things and asks us to, um, to, to do something different with our lives. And we get a sense that God, it's, God's hand's not in it. God's hand's always in it. But, but that we're on our own out there, that we're, we're trying to do something new and we're doing it all by ourselves. And God never does that to us. But when we arrive on the other side, when these guys arrived on the other side of that experience, they had been empowered and they really got a sense that, you know what, um, I can do this. Well, I think God does that for us too. I think God calls us through an epiphany to make a change, to take the risk. And sometimes it feels like we're out there all by ourselves. And yet when we take the risk and we actually come through it on the other side, because we were willing and had the courage to take the risk, God says, see, you can do this. And uh, it's sometimes pretty painful. And yet on the other side, we know that we have the capacity to do things that um, we didn't think we could. And all this, I guess, is a nice story. You know, the three wise men. And I, I'm always amazed at a, a, a nativity scene. You know, the three wise men are always dressed so beautifully. And everybody wants to put the, the wise men out uh, on the, the nativity scene uh, because they're, you know, the, it looks so pretty. And it's a nice story. The three wise men come, the three kings of Orient come, and they leave these gifts for the baby uh, and by the way, we stop the story there. We don't tell the story of them uh, returning and then Herod uh, going to seek and, and the slaughter of the innocents. We stop the story uh, when the wise men leave and everything's fine. And it's a nice story. Um, and I guess the question is, what does it have to do with any of us today? What does it have to do? What does the story have to do with us? How, where you know, why does it involve us? Why should we listen to it other than it's a nice story? Well, I think we can take a quick look and say, you know what, 2020 was a season of epiphanies. Um, we learned some things. We got our heads jerked around. The pandemic said to us, you're not as safe or as immortal or as free to do what we please with a, as consequence as we thought we were. Um, I think for people I talk to, they're saying, you know, wow, I would never have guessed. I would never have known that we, you know, we're not as safe as we think we are from disease. Um, we're not immortal uh, and, and that a disease can take us down all the way and, and can, can leave us dead. 
Um, and I think we're also beginning to see with the numbers constantly increasing that COVID-19, we cannot do what we please. Large gatherings, no mask, being in contact with each other um, and, and not have consequences. Uh, and that's, that's, a, that's an epiphany for a lot of people. And I think we're also finding out we're not as prepared as we thought we were. We're not as prepared to live, work, and educate at home as we thought we were. Um, it was safe. We were what I call fat, dumb, and, and happy. Um, we're not as prepared as we thought we were to deal with illnesses. I mean, the, the, one of the major concerns is that our healthcare system is being overwhelmed, and it is being overwhelmed by this pandemic. Uh, because we weren't as prepared as we thought we were. And we're not as prepared to deal with death as we thought we were. And that's, you know, I, I take, uh, I and the rest of the clergy take, should take um, part of that blame. We, we don't deal with death well, and yet we're being forced to confront it. Uh, and very significantly, we're being uh, forced to confront it um, for many people early, I mean, many of us have to confront it as we come to the end of our lives, but, but having to deal with death was not something we were prepared for, certainly not the death of, of the broad spectrum of people that, that we see. Um, we are also in an epiphany of how we view and do church. Who would have ever thought we were doing, ch we would do church electronically? Um, we certainly see how we view and do politics is being rocked uh, with an epiphany. We understand that it's not that way uh, anymore. Um, you know, it's, it's not, not the way it was, and it has changed, and it will change, um, change in a different way, and we'll have to do it differently on the other side. Um, 2020 also told us, uh, and, and changed and was an epiphany in the role of race and racism and the role of poverty and wealth in our community and our society and and the definition of strength mm -hmm. what was considered strength isn't or, or or may not be considered strength anymore or what was and what is um considered strength now is different um and i think we're gonna have to reevaluate what is strength um, what is the role of poverty? What is the role of wealth in poverty? How does poverty play into this? How does race play into all of this? Whether we like it or not, we're going to have to deal with these issues. These are all epiphanies. They all happened in 2020. And we're going to have to look at them and then plan into how we're going to deal with them because we can't ignore them anymore. One of the things I know about epiphanies is you can't ignore them once they've occurred. And I guess I would ask you too, because I, you know, maybe it's just me, but what personal epiphanies did you have in 2020? It wasn't just the societal epiphanies. What did you learn? What what got your attention uh, in 2020? And and then what was God trying to tell you with that epiphany? You see, I, I think God used 2020 uh, to to tell us some things to wake us up. Um, now, whether we choose to go back to sleep or whether we choose to deal with it is a choice, but I think we've got to ask the question, what personal epiphanies did we have in 2020? What are the things that are changing the way we think about things and, and force us to change the way we think about things? I mean, was God calling us to change so that we can help others change? Um, in other words, we as Christians when we become Christians, our life is supposed to change. If you read scripture, that's what it says. When we become a Christian, our life changes. Well, if our life changes and then we're called to be uh, disciples and we're called to make disciples, help others change, then how do we have to change for that to happen? And, and how, do we, um, how do we now respond to that call of helping others make the change? of coming back to God, of being disciples. Um, by the way, you can't become, you can't change someone else unless you're willing to change your own life. Um, and I think that's very much, as Christians, as the church, we're called to change the lives of others, but that takes courage and it takes a willingness on our part to change and it takes some guts and courage is not easy. 
And uh, the, the statement I just made, you can't change the lives of others unless you have the courage to change your own. You can't call others to change who they are and what they do and how they respond to things um, and, and to do what God has called them to do unless we have the courage to, to change our own. That's, uh, that's one of those hard things <laughs> that I think we, we don't talk about as Christians. And again, I think it's one of those things we need to talk about as people come into the church, as people become members of the church, we need to be honest with them and have the conversation to say, look, how is your life going to change? How are you willing to change your life before we start changing other people's lives? So uh, I guess my question for you today is what difference will the story of the coming Magi have for you? I mean, will it be an epiphany? Will today's story be an epiphany? Will it be something that says to you, mm, I understand now some things I didn't. And it's calling me to do something, to make a positive change. Um, will their visit make a difference in our lives? Um, you know, will, will knowing the, the Magi visited Christ and, and the story thereof, will it make a difference in our own lives? Will we let it make a difference in our own lives? And frankly, it all depends on if we have the courage and to make the necessary changes. Do we have the willingness and the courage to let go of what was and take hold of what God has given us, even though it's going to be a wild ride sometimes. Do we have the guts to do that? Or do we want to stay in our nice, safe little box, which then keeps being us, keeping us in the box while it may be safe, um, you, you're not going to enjoy or, or experience much of life from there. I guess the question is, are really, are you willing to be courageous? you have the courage to deal with epiphanies and the epiphanies that we have? Do we have the guts to deal with what God has put in front of us? Will you choose what is, what is evil, easy? Are we going to make the easy choices? Are we going to say, yeah, thanks, but you know, I'm going to stay where I am? Or are we going to choose what is right? And I think that is a fundamental question today and we're going to face this in the coming days over the next coming weeks and the coming months are we going to choose what is easy or are we going to choose what is right are we going to choose what is self-serving or are we going to choose what god has called us to choose and that is that which makes a loving difference in the lives of not just ourselves but of others i'm going to encourage you to do what is right and not what is very easy and i think that's what god calls us to do to do what is right not what is easy. So in other words, what changes are you going to initiate in your own life in 2021? What ministries are you going to begin? What risks will you take for God? And, and I hear us all saying, you know, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm older. I'm at the end of my life. It doesn't matter. What are we going to change? What ministries will we take on that are different from, or will we engage in more fully? What risks are we willing to take for God? What difference will we make in the life of this congregation? Whose life will you change in a positive way? I think those are all questions that the epiphany of 2020 has asked us. And by the way, the questions are the same for this congregation. In other words, we as a congregation need to be saying, what changes are we going to initiate? What ministries will we begin? What risks will we take for God? Um, whose lives will we change? That's the questions for this congregation as well. We need to have those conversations if we're going to be a congregation and exist beyond just subsistence. So I guess the question is, will this Sunday be an epiphany? or just another Sunday to check off the calendar. Folks, that's up to you. Amen. We come now to our time of prayer with, with God, our time to have conversation with God. We certainly give, um, uh, before we start, we give, we give praise uh, to, to Lisa's new grandson, John Whalen Morgan, eight pounds, two ounces, and 20 inches. Uh, that's, that's a pretty good sized baby. And, uh, the joy that the baby will bring, but also an epiphany. And the epiphany is that God's not done with us yet as, as, a, as human beings, um, but at least it should remind us that there are new lives out there that have not, that will grow up and have to be an encounter with Christ. How do we prepare those who will bring them to encounter and how do we, we 
walk with those who will be the parents and the, the, the guides for, for uh, John as he goes on and any other new child that comes into the world. Certainly we pray for the city of Pine Bluff, uh, police and first responders. And I would add to that um, the grocery store workers. I saw an interesting special the other day um, and you know the folks that make sure we have food uh, on the shelves are, are suffering uh, and are as much at risk in some cases as those who are first responders or, or frontliners uh, in terms of the healthcare industry. We certainly pray for those who have corona, who are recovering. We pray for their families, pray for those who have lost their lives. And uh, we just pray for anyone who's encountered and engaged with COVID. But I think we also need to pray for those who, who are not, um, that we don't get so overwhelmed by COVID-19 that we stop living our lives. Let's come to God in prayer. Almighty and merciful God, we, we ask your blessing and we ask that you will watch over us, hold us in the hollow of your hand, protect us uh, from, from the disease if that's your will, but also Lord, keep us tuned in and alert for the epiphanies. Show us where we can make a difference and then give us the strength and courage to do so. Um, Help us to, to live our lives as you want, you want us to live our lives and help us to do so with a focus on you, not on our own selfish interests. Lord, as we, we come through the coming days uh, in the changeover of a, of, a, of a government of leadership, Lord, please in, engage and, and, and involve your your love, your care. Um, show us how we're supposed to do this. Show us what we're to do and, and help us to make decisions that will end up being the best for your entire family, your entire children. Uh, please watch over us. Please keep violence to a minimum in all of that because there's a potential there may be some. And we pray that that violence not take innocent lives and take the form of doing harm to those who really uh, on both sides are looking to do what is best. Um, just please watch over us. Lord, be with the first responders, be with those who are on the front lines of the healthcare industry. Help us to get a plan together that gets the um, immunizations out and help us, Lord, to, to be able to respond to this coronavirus before it mutates any further and gets west and gets worse. Um, Lord, also, we give you praise and thanks. You've given us so much. You've given us ways to communicate when there, there were, when communication has become so difficult and so much more uh, uh, space creating. Uh, communication is mission critical and you've given us ways to do that. We say thank you. We thank you for beautiful days. We thank you for people who are willing to step up and step in. So many things we say thank you for, Lord, and uh, all these things, uh, please know that we are grateful for. You know the requests that we have on our hearts that we didn't speak. We ask that you would intervene in those as well and help us to feel your presence day in, day out. Help us to be open to your leading, your guiding, your epiphanies, and uh, your call. All these things we pray in Jesus' precious name, who taught us to pray so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We ask that you continue to bring your offerings to the church or send them in or, or just give them to us some way. And we say thank you to those who, who have done that. Um, and as we come into the new year, we'll figure out how, how to pay the bills and what bills uh, we're, we're willing to take on and what ministries we're willing to take on. But thank you. But please continue to send uh, your, your offerings to the church or drop them off, if you will.
God of light and promise, we bring our gifts to further your work in a dark world. May they bring your light to those overwhelmed by darkness and pain and loneliness. Accept these gifts of money and time. Indeed, the gift of our very souls, our very selves. Let them shine for all to see and be brought into the sphere of your love and righteousness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. bring to an end our time of worship together and uh, look for the epiphanies in your life please um go back explore 2020 and see what epiphanies might have come out of there some of them we might have missed i certainly i'm sure i missed a bunch too but go back and take a look at them and then say okay what were the epiphanies what were the things that that should have gotten my attention what were the things that did get my attention and and what am i supposed to do with that I think this is a good time at the end of the year of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 to actually take a look at that and say, what things should we leave behind? Uh, and what things should we go looking for and pick up? What, what new things should we do uh, to take the place of the things that we can no longer do? How do we need to change? That's the story. That's the whole point, I think, of epiphany and the story of the the coming of the magi and so go do something with it see what you can now may grace mercy and peace from god the father god the son and god the holy spirit be with you this day and forevermore amen, amen. Oh.